Nikki, the boss. What's up, my man? What's going on? You know, it's, uh, it's starting to get cold outside. I've been in Texas and now I'm back in New York and it's freezing, uh, suddenly cold all of a sudden again. It's probably 80 uh, at home, right? Or what's, what's it like in Houston right now? Well, we're actually getting a cold front come through today. That's why the roof's going to be closed for games one and two. Um, it's about 75 right now, but it's supposed to rain around noontime. And tomorrow the high is only 68, which for us is really the danger zone. I actually heard that the weather is supposed to be good uh, at Keeneland for Breeders' Cup. I've heard 75 as the high. That's that's the word. Yeah, nationwide uh, kind of warm front next week, which, hey, that'll be nice. That's You know, when we went in 2015, it really wasn't cold. It was just dreary. You know, it was just gray yeah. and, and the sun never came out, especially on my wagering. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, well, this year we wanted to have you on. I, I wanted to have you specifically because I feel like one of the hardest races, or at least the most talked about races, to make a line for. Uh, and, and you'll be doing the morning line for all 14 races, Breeders' Cup races, and the undercar races as well, uh, was the distaff. And, and I know that you take your, your task seriously in, in making those lines. And so I figured you spent a lot of time looking at these races in depth to try to predict, predict what the public was going to do. Uh, what have you come up with so far with just the pre-entries? Who, who are you going to make the favorite? You know, so this is a funny one because one of the difficult tasks of, about making a morning line, the most thankless job in horse racing, is um, separating yourself from your own wagering ideas. And I would never bet nest in this race under virtually any circumstance. And it has nothing to do with any kind of dislike I have for her. I think she's really good. I think she's a deserving Eclipse Award winner. This is just a lot like, you know, your backgrounds in football. And when Boise State would play some of those the, that, you know, cupcake schedule on the blue turf, and then they'd play a big team at the end of the season, from a betting perspective, Boise State was always interesting because they were always a big underdog. Nest is kind of like Boise State, but favored. And I think that's the problem is that the public is going to really hone in on all of those ones because the public loves ones. They're going to see blowout margins. They're going to see uh, an in the money finish in a triple crown race. And they're really going to get in on her. And, you know, I don't want to say that I sort of crowdsourced this morning line, but I threw a little chum in the water a few weeks ago and, and asked, you know, what I put the PPs of Nest, Clarier and Malathot up. And I said, you know, what, what do these horses go off price wise? And it wasn't because I was going to really base my opinion on that, but I really wanted to see what the public did. And overwhelmingly the support is there for Nest. So I'm going to have Nest at about eight or nine to five, her stable mate Mala thought around five to two or three to one. And, um, and then everybody else is going to kind of filter out from there, but you know, it, it becomes a difficult task from there as well, because what do you do with a horse like Clarier? You know, Clarier was a huge favorite in the personal engine and, you know, in, in very un Asmussen like fashion, in my opinion, he didn't bring her back for another race before the breeders cup distaff, which I really, really wish he had just so we could get a gauge on what exactly happened last time, because the Clarier that we saw in the apple blossom, the Phipps and the shoe V she'd win this race. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I guess there's the, the, the built in excuse uh, that she has for that race where she, I guess she bit her tongue, um, and, and Steve feels like that was part of her, her, her you know, and it, and it makes sense. I think some people might scoff at that idea, but you know, if you bite your tongue and, and you're out there, someone's pulling on your mouth, you might pull on the brakes a little bit. I, I don't, I don't have a problem with that idea. And, and I think she'll probably be a good enough price that if you feel like that is a, a legitimate excuse, you might have some opportunity there with the other two Todd Pletcher runners taking a majority of the money. Yeah, I mean, and I, I will tell you, I was live watching the race. We were sitting probably between the 16th pole and the finish line, and there was a lot of noise in that gate. And so it sounded like, you know, she may have hit into the gate before, and um, and then it was just a listless performance, right? I mean, it was it's one thing for her to have run poorly and, and to have chased the pace and maybe gotten tired or something like that, but she was just a no-show, almost as if something else had to have gone wrong. And, I mean, and Asmus and I trust in terms of, of continuing on with her and bringing her back for this race, so... I think from a tactical perspective, the horse that really holds a lot of the keys to this race is society because society is very fast 
and she's likely to get a, a pretty unencumbered lead. And, you know, I kind of see it as a, a relay race where she probably passes the baton to search results, who when push comes to shove is probably a little bit better, shorter than a mile and an eighth. And, you know, and then you're going to have Nest, Clarier, and Malathot waiting in the wings from that point. And, you know, Malathot is, is such a grinder that I think, and, and has performed so well at Keeneland, that if you get her in gear early enough, you know, I think she's just going to kind of be a freight train that's going to be tough to hold off. It feels like she's kind of as good as she's been and as, as ridiculous as it is to say about a horse that has her resume, she's sort of the now horse. Yeah. As much as I want to lean on the top two in here from a, from a, you know, a wagering perspective, you know, you're playing a, a multi-race bet. I'd like to think that, that I could nest Malathot turn the page. But the problem is, is that you can really see any one of these horses winning, like not any of them, but most of them society, right? If she runs her race last time, like you mentioned, she gets loose out on the front end. She's a horse that could wire these, these horses based on her speed figure last time. Secret oath is going to have to go all the way back to the spring to find a race. I think to be able to win this one, but it's always possible, right? Maybe she likes getting back to Kentucky. Maybe she appreciates the mile and an eighth. Maybe she needed some time off. Maybe it was a lot they were asking her to do. Or maybe she just went sour. I'm voting for the last one. She went sour. But she's the type of horse I think you could consider as well. But search results is one I did want to spend a little bit of time on because her race uh, in at Belmont um, in, the, in the FIPS was one of my favorite races of hers all year long. And she was deep. I think if she could run that race, she could find that performance. I think she could be dangerous. I totally agree. I mean, and I think she's by far and away the forgotten horse in this race. And, um, and by no means does she deserve, you know, no billing. She deserves to, to certainly have a lot of attention paid to her. As you mentioned, Mary Phipps was sensational. And, and I thought she ran pretty well in the personal ends and all things considered, you know, the, the interesting thing from a tactical perspective is, you know, she's had to watch dog Latruska a couple of times in, in the Phipps and the uh, personal ends. And, and I think, you know, if the connections had it to do over again, they probably would say, you know, we shouldn't have been as worried about Latruska as we were, but, you know, we're all thinking of the 2021 Latruska who could basically wire almost any field uh, full of, of female horses. So I wonder if you don't want to play it fast and loose with society, right? I mean, you're not going to let society get too clear because then she might get a little bit brave too. I just wonder how many of these horses that are going to be forced to potentially go a little bit quicker early than they might want to could ultimately pay a little bit of a price as well. So search results could really get a good trip stalking a substantially slower pace than she's had to in both the personal ends and, and the FIPS. And, you know, that will, that will obviously improve her chances quite a bit. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we get to the eighth pole of this race and search results is in front and you've got those three big timers running at her uh, nick if you were forced uh, which we're not forced in the breeders cup betting challenge to play all of these races but if you were kind of forced to, to play a you know a thousand dollars into this race um how do you feel like you would attack it would you would you try to attack i know you're a huge fan of the tri pool is that would you try to attack it there and if so how how would you do that so i think i would zag here instead of, of zigging and uh, if she was three to one or better i'd bet all my money on Malathot to win there you go. That's easy. That's an I mean, easy, work, easy it work for you, right? Hey, look, <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't Monomoy girl. Wasn't three to one. No, uh, she was not. And, and I think, you know, I mean, I, I play it fast and loose as somebody who's, you know, just bullshitting with you and not playing the breeders cup betting challenge. Cause obviously it's a little conflict of interest, but um, yeah, I mean, I would have no problem if I had eight, $9,000, you know, especially with the guys that I generally play these contests with telling them, look, we're going to try and, and get this eight and turn it into to 32 so that we've got some bullets to fire in the turf and the classic. And, and I don't think it would take much convincing because I think that's a great price on her. I think she'll probably end up somewhere around there. I'm hoping the public just comes in really, really hard on nest. What, what tactics do you think that they're going to use for nest? I mean, I think one of the things that's great about her is that she's, she can go forward. She can also come from, from out of it. What do you think that they'll do in the situation with her? I think probably similar to the Ashland. I'm sure they're they're kind of hoping for an outside post. She rates very comfortably on the outside. Um, you know, the, the the thing about Ness that I have to give her a lot of credit for is that her coaching club, American Oaks, while she beat, you know, three totally overmatched, four totally overmatched rivals, she was she set a hot pace but by time form U.S. standards. So she's faster, obviously a lot faster early than horses like Malathot and Clarier. I think with her, what you're trying to do, because she has that really quick step and can kind of burst away, is you're trying to get the jump on the on the deeper closers and, um, and just hope that they can't come and get you. 
So she's probably in that flight just behind search results, but also ahead of Malathot and Clarier, hoping that they can, can beat them to the punch. Not the largest field we'll see uh, next weekend or coming up weekend, depending on when you're watching this, the first Friday and Saturday it, uh, in the Breeders' Cup at Keeneland. But it, it is one of my favorite races. I, I can't wait to see what happens here. It's going to be a showdown of some really talented older mares. It's one of the most consistent divisions I think we saw all year with really good horses just showing up and showing up and showing up. So it's going to be a, a ton of fun to see what happens here. And boss man, we wish you the best of luck with your lines that everyone seems to probably care way too much about. And we'll miss you uh, this year. And good luck with your Astros. I appreciate it. I will. Uh, I'll certainly be there. So I'm ready to. I'm ready to be at the Breeders' Cup and just enjoy it as a fan as much as possible. Embrace your inner villain. So go Astros. Subscribe, comment, talk about Nick's Astros shirt if you want to. Uh, follow us, Twitter, Instagram. Subscribe to the podcast. You know the deal. We'll see you guys next week.